Hi, my name is Alan Sens, and I'm sitting outside the UBC farm here at the University of British Columbia. Welcome to the Global Politics Instructional Video Series. In this series, we are looking at a number of the key concepts relevant to the study of global politics and international relations. And today, we are looking at the United Nations Security Council. Now, the United Nations Security Council is one of the principal organs of the United Nations system, and it is charged with primary responsibility for the maintenance of international peace and security. And what that means is that the Security Council is responsible for encouraging the peaceful settlement of disputes, for creating peacekeeping operations, for imposing sanctions, and even for authorizing the use of military force. So obviously, the United Nations Security Council is a very important world body. Let's take a closer look. The United Nations Security Council. Now, currently, there are 15 states on the United Nations Security Council, so I'm just going to draw 15 countries. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. There we go. Fifteen member states. Now, of these fifteen countries, five of them have a veto. One is the United States, another is France, another is the United Kingdom, another is Russia, and another is the People's Republic of China. So those five countries are the permanent members of the UN Security Council, or the so-called P5. And they all have a veto, which is why they are sometimes called the veto-wielding members of the Council. The other ten members of the Council are elected members, and they are elected by the General Assembly. And there's actually a complicated formula for drawing countries from various regions around the world. And you can look at that in more detail if you like, but we're not going to cover it here. And each elected country is on the Security Council for a two-year term. So every year, five of these countries are being replaced. In order to pass a resolution, a United Nations Security Council resolution, it requires nine affirmative votes out of 15 and no vetoes. In other words, if any one of these five countries casts their veto, this resolution fails. It will not pass. It will not be adopted by the United Nations Security Council. Otherwise, in addition to that, you need nine out of 15 votes. Now, there are abstentions, and contrary to the actual wording of the United Nations Charter, an abstention in practice means that a resolution can pass if one of these five veto-wielding members abstains from the vote. You still need a 9 out of 15 to get the resolution to pass, but that's one other possibility. You might get an abstention rather than a veto, and that's okay. Now, obviously, the politics of all this are really quite extraordinary. Uh, not only is there a great deal of concern that a proposed resolution might be vetoed by any of these five countries, and so a lot of diploma, uh, diplomacy and diplomatic activity goes on trying to determine whether or not someone is going to veto, but there are also concerns about whether these elected members will support a resolution. So there's a lot of politics, behind the scenes negotiation, debate, coercion, and reward goes on as countries try to secure the approval of their resolutions in the Security Council. What this means, of course, is a lot of the decisions made by the Security Council, the wording of the resolutions, what the United Nations Security Council actually decides, is a product of consensus. It's a product of lowest common denominator uh, outcomes, because it's the product of what 9 out of 15 
with no vetoes uh, is possible with respect to the wording of a resolution. Now, there's a lot of criticism of the, of the United Nations Security Council, of course. Uh, many argue that it gives disproportionate power to the permanent five members because of the veto. And because these five members also happen to be nuclear weapon states, also happen to be the world's largest weapons exporters, many argue that this is contrary to the principles of the United Nations that these five countries would wield such disproportionate power in the United Nations Security Council. Another argument, another criticism, is that the Security Council lacks any kind of enforcement capability. The United Nations has no army, uh, and although it can embark on peacekeeping missions and the like, uh, the reality is, is that its resolutions are often ignored, or if they are enforced, they're enforced in a very selective, very politically uh, determined manner. There's been a lot of talk, finally, about the membership of the Security Council. Many, many criticize uh, this membership, saying it's not truly representative. And the argument here is that there has to be Security Council reform by bringing in new members or expanding the number of states that sit on the Security Council. So some suggestions are that Germany, um, India, Brazil, and Japan should become permanent members of the Security Council. Uh, whether or not they would get a veto is, of course, a matter of intense debate. Then there are suggestions that the membership could be expanded. You could add another five countries and go to 20, and there's another proposal out there for 24. But whatever reform package is being considered, you have to remember that in order for that reform to be successfully adopted requires a United Nations Security Council resolution, and you guessed it, it's subject to the veto of these five countries. So any possibility of reform is actually based on whether or not you can get approval for that reform within the current structure of the Security Council. Quite a dilemma. Okay, so that was the United Nations Security Council. Now, obviously, in the future, the United Nations Security Council could change. But today, just the way it is, the Security Council is still a very important body. Even though it's widely criticized, one of the questions that has to be asked is, would we be able to create a Security Council today? Would there be consensus on the membership? Would there be the ability to create the UN system as we have it today? And there's a very good argument to say that we wouldn't be able to do it, so maybe what we've got is the best that we could reasonably hope to have. I hope you enjoyed this video. Join me again next time.